All right, welcome to chapter 14. Uh, we are continuing our study here in Introduction to Criminal Justice, CJC 111, here at Wake Tech Community College. Uh, these lectures are based upon Criminal Justice in Action, uh, the 11th edition of that textbook, published by Cengage. The authors, again, are Larry Gaines and Roger Leroy Miller. Um, so if you're following along, we're up to chapter 14. Now, one of the things I'm going to do here is I'm going to seek to add some supplemental material for North Carolina and also try to give you a little bit of um, more factual and a few things I think are highlights. But by and large, we'll stick to uh, chapter 14, which is about pretty much about the prison experience. So we, we talked in our last chapter about uh, jails uh, and prisons. But what we're going to talk about, as opposed to the whole institution, is we're going to talk about how someone uh, lives in it, how someone goes through it. Um, you can talk about the, the buildings, you can talk about the people that run them, but you have to talk about the people that inhabit them. So this is really the prison experience, if you will. So moving along here, a few quick questions to ask before we get started. As usual, I have these uh, lined up for you so that we can, you know, keep these in mind as we're going through um, what these things mean. Give us a context, in other words. Okay, almost everyone who goes to prison eventually will get released. How should we prepare the inmate for this? Um, is that even our responsibility? So one of the frequent questions and criticisms of our system is a lot of people that get out of prison go back to prison. All right, let's fix that. Are prisoners still people? And what rights do they keep and which do they lose and why? Uh, this is a constant struggle. Again, I, I've talked about in, in class the idea of, in psychology, um, creating the other, someone outside someone that you don't have to identify easily as a human being. This allows you to suspend your innate sense of empathy or caring for others and treat them more as objects than people. Now at the extreme end, people who have no empathy, that's a, that's a sociopath or an asocial personality. Uh, now we have to do some of that because you are going to take a human being and lock them up in a cage sometimes for years. The question is, how much can you take away from them? What rights do they keep? What rights do they lose? Do they have the right to practice what religion they want? Do they have the right to belong to a political party? Should they have the right to vote? Uh, when they get out, should they have the right to vote? Should they have the right to own a gun? Um, fundamental question, the fourth one, why do people wind up back in prison? And this, I think, relates back to our first one. How do we prepare them to succeed as opposed to fail? What are prisons like for everybody? Um, I think you need to think about that prisons exist for society, but society is composed of individuals. So there are the inmates, obviously. There are also visitors who go to prison very frequently. There are victims who will sometimes go to prisons. Relatives, relatives of both victims and visitors and inmates. Um, corrections officers, everybody. There's a lot of people in this process. So how do they experience everything? Okay, again, here are our learning objectives where we explain, describe, list, contrast. Uh, the, the goals really we're trying to cover in this chapter. You don't have to know these directly, but it's really what we cover during the whole chapter. Okay, let's talk about prison culture. Um, all institutions that are comprehensive, the military, um, a church, uh, all these will have a set of values and prisons are no exception here. These help the people in the organization understand what you can do and what you can't do. Now there can be formal rules and there can be informal rules. Now of course prison is, you can't leave prison if you're the inmate. Now you do if you're the guard and you're experiencing it, but the inmate is there. So it is very much what we call a total institution. It's going to provide you all the necessities. It's the center of your existence. Uh, you know, even in a, uh, an institution for a civilian like the military, you, you can, assuming it's not a war, go home at the end of the day or go to your barracks and relax or go out on liberty and go and leave. Um, prisons aren't like that. For the inmates, they're there completely. So we call them total institutions. So 
the process that goes on here is called prisonization. This is where the culture of the prison comes into existence and that culture makes its way into both the prisoners and to some extent even the people that work there. So we, we, crudely we take an individual who comes into a prison as a civilian, as a member of the public, you know, kind of the nickname say John Q. Public, that's a frequent nickname for and then at the end of this, however long this period is, they come out of prison and they are, well in prison they become a convict and out of prison they're ex-convict. It's how they are defined. So criminologists who study this process, and this process again is called uh, prisonization, um, look and see how prisoners change their behavior. What, what's different between that civilian John Q. Public who comes in on that first night and that ex-convict that walks out a year, five years, ten years later. How does life behind bars change people and their behavior? Okay, well, part of this is how are they going to react in prison? And here are four ways. Now, there are a multitude of ways you can talk about this. Um, the classic way is doing time, where if you're kind of a professional criminal, if you will, a habitual offender, you're going to go to prison, you're going to stay out of trouble because you want to get back out of prison as soon as possible, you're just going to do your time. Then there's those who really jailing, this is something that it really becomes their life. Uh, they Often they're in since juvenile incarceration and they become integrated very much into it. Gleaning, um, this is something I guess it's positive we think about where what you're trying to do is take advantage of opportunities like education. You can go to prison and get your GED, uh, or you can go to prison and, and learn a skill, perhaps. And then there are ones that have great difficulties really adapting at all. And, you know, one of the things that can happen is you can have people in prison that have relatively low uh, intelligence scores. Um, IQ is a very poor measure in, in some ways, but it can be predictive. Um, you have people who have mental illnesses. Uh, now these, something we call disorganized criminals, and disorganized is a, very much a term of the art. You see that a lot in the criminal justice system. For example, the, um, the FBI describes serial killers as either organized or disorganized in some ways. So you do have prisoners in the prisonization process that have a great deal of difficulty or become very exploited by the system because of these issues of mental illness or intelligence. Okay, so who's in prison? Um, and I apologize, this is a little bit um, hunky. Um, the first, uh, if you look at this chart, um, you'll notice, uh, let's look at the gender issue. Now, the, the, the green line is your general population. So if we look at those first two blocks, you'll notice that approximately there's an equal number of men and women in our society. Women are actually going to slightly outnumber men, and that's true in all post-industrial societies. Not true, by the way, in agricultural societies, there'll be a surplus of males. Um, you'll notice, though, the prison there, um, and that's going to be comparing the blue lines uh, among those groups, uh, that remember just the first two parts of those groups, you're going to see that it's about 90% male. It's a, it's a male game, prison is. Uh, jail's going to be a little bit more equal, but prison is very much a male game. Um, and that really means that if you're a man, you're about eight or nine times as likely to be arrested and sent to prison as if you're a woman. Which, you know, begs a question, why? The next three blocks, and if you've listened to my lectures, you know I have problems with breaking up populations in this way. So let me, let me just emphasize that again. You certainly can talk about the definition of race in the United States. Um, it's, it doesn't have a biological definition. It has a social definition, one that's uh, both imposed and accepted. So you can say someone is black or someone is white. Um, but you often have groups that straddle or will self-identify with one or the other or will be imposed in one or the other. So um, one of the things that's happened really in the last, I would say, 40, 50 years in the United States is that we have begun to treat an ethnic group 
in this case Hispanic, which is again a, a very difficult thing to define in some ways. Do you mean simply someone that has a heritage that speaks Spanish or a Latin based language like Portuguese? Because after all, if you said no, I'm, I'm talking about people that come from South and Central America. Well, the, the largest country in, in South America is Portugal, uh, Portuguese speaking Brazil, excuse me. So are you going to include those? And then there's significant populations um, in South and Central America that are indigenous Indians uh, or indigenous Native Americans, if you will, that don't speak Spanish. Are you going to classify them as Hispanic? You might say, well, we're, we're interested what culture they came from. And you can see how this definition gets harder and harder and harder to apply because you can have black Hispanics and white Hispanics. And then you can have Hispanics that don't identify as either. They simply say, I'm Hispanic. All right, well, what about someone that's a Spanish speaker born in Europe? Um, you know, they might look very white. Or they might be a recent immigrant from the former Spanish colonies. Say they had some small colonies in Africa, Morocco. So you, you can see this is very complex. But having said that digression, I apologize for it. If you look at the U.S. population of blacks, um, you'll see that it's right around 12-13%, but if you look at the prison population, we're up over 40%. Whites are somewhere north of 60-65% of the U.S. population, and they're about 40, maybe less, of the um, prison population, so significantly fewer whites than we would expect to be represented. Uh, Hispanics are a lar the largest minority group in the United States. They're approaching 20% of the U.S. population at this point, um, but they're closer to 25% of the prison population. So again, they're overrepresented. Okay, some looming problems to talk about in prison. So we're going to talk a little bit about health, age, and mental illness. So these are some of the most recent statistics I could find when I was looking. Um, we have decided in the United States that our prison terms are going to be very long. And the result of that is um, the percentage of prisoners over 65 in the United States grew by 67% in the last decade or so. And now over 10% of those people in prison are effectively senior citizens over 55. And in some states, those numbers are much higher. And you'd be surprised at some of those states. Uh, the ones I found doing my research um, well, I think Montana was the 17% there, and I want to say New Hampshire or Vermont was the 15%. So you can have you know, very large numbers of people because don't forget the whole society is getting older. And that, that creates really unique problems in prisons, like physical problems. What do you do with someone that's 65 or 75 with very limited mobility when you need them to get up, get out of their cell, go down a flight of stairs, and go to the cafeteria to eat? Alien inmate populations. Medical budgets are really straining correctional budgets. Now the Supreme Court rules that you have a right, and this was in the Brown versus Plata case, you have a right to basic medical. Now you're not going to get plastic surgery, you, but you are going to get things like, you know, if your appendix bursts, we're going to take it out. If you're a diabetic, we're going to give you insulin. And then we've got our mental health issue. Um, most public mental health hospitals uh, that existed in the 1960s and 70s, which were quite large, an example here in Raleigh would be Dorothea Dix, are effectively shut down and closed. So jails and prison has absorbed a large number of these. Let's look at some quick graphs. This is how the number of old prisoners uh, grew in a 15 year period um, remarkably fast. So the, the, the chart's a little bit misleading the way it's structured, but you'll notice that adults under 55 um, went up only marginally, a small amount, went up from about uh, 1.256 million to 1.92. So it went up 30,000. But there were a lot more to start with. If you look at adults over 55, though, we go from 43,000 incarcerated to 164. 4,000 incarcerated by 2016. This is a massive increase. This really is a, is a tidal wave looming for you. And this number, if it keeps, on, it keeps on that trajectory, is going to get worse and worse and worse. Medical spending. Now, this, this chart this chart's actually a bit larger, 
um, it actually has all the states but I wanted to crop it there to show you the increase now North Carolina there at the bottom traditionally had been spending um, per year per inmate um, and this is in constant dollars about two thousand dollars and now we're spending uh, almost six thousand dollars some states are worse than us uh, California notice is very high um, Alaska is very high uh, these are these can be very expensive one of the things you have to factor in when you say I'm going to put people in jail for long periods of time is all right um, the longer they're there the more expensive they become medically to take care of this is one of my favorite charts it's a little bit dated but I think it really gives you a very nice picture um, the red line there is the combined rates of people that were incarcerated either in prisons or jails and you notice they essentially we add those two things together um, and there's actually more people in the 1940s 50s 60s even in 1970 there's more people in our mental hospitals than in our prisons but then we start to shut them down um, I grew up near what was called Rockland State Mental Institution it was shut down um, mental illness did not disappear in the United States mental illness continued and those people that had mental illness that expressed itself in behavioral issues like outbursts of violence or inappropriate behavior uh, whereas in the past you might have had uh, them in mental hospitals uh, that 600,000 that was a fairly constant number uh, between about 1930 and about 1970 ish um, it, it drops to nothing so where did they go well the, where they went because uh, you can see that line goes up they, they went to prison and jail so uh, if you're running a prison one of the most difficult things you're going to have to handle is what are you going to do with mentally ill inmates all right rehabilitation in prison um, organized activities designed to improve physical and mental health vocational skills or keep people occupied one of the big things that has been a psychological success is CBT cognitive behavioral, behavioral therapy this is a very practical approach it's giving individuals tools to handle emotional issues um, life issues trying to get them to think through their problems trying to explain you know you, you can't do this because of this result um, it can be very difficult because very often people don't get emotional education the benefits of having any sort of rehabilitation is they're not bored and bored inmates are dangerous inmates uh, you're going to improve their health and their skill sets if you can teach them hey you know you shouldn't eat sugar and you shouldn't uh, consume massive amounts of you know fat um, that's going to help uh, all sorts of issues both in their lives in prison and out it's going to reduce um, recidivism rates now part of the problem with this is you have to spend this money to save the money later and it's a very difficult idea to go to um, the public and say I want to spend more money on benefits in prison for inmates people will say oh hell no uh, you know lock them up throw the key all right it's gonna be much more expensive and people will often say well it's okay spend the money yeah uh, you want to spend you know forty thousand dollars a year that's your issue prison violence uh, prisons and jails are dangerous places to live and it's often predicated on violence I think the answer here to, to start with the kind of precursor to this is why it's full of young men young men are violent uh, and often they have emotional uh, difficulties or lower intelligence rates um, and again these tend to point towards violence so they are hierarchies that are established and one of the ways you establish a hierarchy if you don't have an institutional imposition of it is you do it by force it provides a deterrence against being a victim people are violent against others so that there isn't violence against them it can enhance your self-image you don't have much to distinguish yourself in prison so sometimes you'll do self in some events almost self mutilation which are prison tattoos or, or cutting um, but also if you're known as the baddest guy in prison or someone willing to use force it enhances self-image 
sexual relief. Uh, this is in regards to rape. And remember, rape is a crime of violence here. It also can be a means of, of acquiring the very meager material goods that you can get from other prisoners. So until the 1970s, um, there wasn't a lot of interference. Um, and, and also, prisons didn't, didn't really be, weren't expressed as violent. Gradually, though, the, the idea where you just you did your time, you stu stuck away from everybody else, step, step back, was replaced, and violence became more common. Uh, again, you can get stuff, you can get sex, you can improve your image, you can prevent becoming a victim. So, why violence is a reaction? One of the explanations here is um, a deprivation model. If you can't get freedom of movement, basic consumer goods, sex, and other staples, you turn to what you can do, and that's violence. And researchers use the term relative deprivation to explain this. Inmates are, inmate violence is caused when freedom or services that you accept as normal are decreased or eliminated, even those very minimal ones you see in prison. Um, I. I compiled here, and this is not in your text, some of the worst riots in American history. I included some for North Carolina, which aren't necessarily bad. There's a bomb too, but let's look at them quickly. I tried to pick some in the 20th century. You got Montana in 1959, where actually the inmates there seized the entire prison. Um, there was kind of a negotiated end. The people that were behind it, there was a murder-suicide, so two dead. Uh, Atlanta, this occurred in 1987. Um, they overran big parts of the prison. They took 200 hostages. It eventually was settled uh, with one dead. Lee Prison in South Carolina, 2018, a few years back. Um, this was interesting because competing prison gangs, kind of fighting each other and kind of not, seized the prison. Uh, they killed eight informants. Southern Ohio, 1993. Gangs here united to seize it. Uh, they held the prison for 11 days. They killed uh, nine people. Attica Prison, arguably the most famous prison riot, 1971. Here they seized the prison, and by the time the governor and the warden sent in uh, troops to quell the riot, 38 were dead, including eight of the hostages, and most of the hostages obviously were guards. New Mexico prison, which was the worst in the United States about 1980. This required really intervention of uh, National Guard, and this left 33 dead. Uh, now, there are prisons outside the United States. Some tend to be much worse. Some tend to be much better. Um, I've seen prison fatality rates in looking at studies of this of over 100. So certainly it happens. Now, uh, there were, there's one very recent one and one kind of older one. Uh, there's the Central Prison Riot, 1968. This is seen as a precursor to the Attica Riot, um, where the prisoners, and there hasn't been a riot in Central Prison since this, interestingly enough. 75 people were injured, including two corrections officers and stu two state troopers, but no one was killed. They, they took over blocks of the prison. Recently, we had, uh, a couple years back, right before COVID, in Salisbury, North Carolina, um, an attempted riot at least, 12 injured including four stabbed. So North Carolina is not immune to this issue either. What causes these riots? Well, as I said, um, they're relatively rare, but if you went back to that chart, you notice we kind of have a rash of them breaking out after the 1970s, which I think interestingly enough is when you also get in a lot of people who had mental illness problems. Because again, we're closing down those mental hospitals. Overcrowding is a big one. So, for example, uh, in Alabama, one prison had three riots in one year, and it was uh, designed to only hold a thousand inmates. Uh, excuse me, six hundred, but it had a thousand in it. If you have an unresponsive or brutal prison administration, or if you've got um, a lack of fairness and discipline, poor food, no recreation offices, and friction between ethnic and racial groups, going to cause this too. Let's talk a little bit about rape in prison, because that's one of the expressions of this violence. It is ex 
exceedingly difficult to measure what the rape rate is. It's hard to measure it in our larger society because rape carries a negative connotation. In many ways, the victim can be ostracized. The victim can be looked down upon. This can be true because most of these rapes are same gender rapes. This is particularly true in male on male rape. Men will be in some ways hesitant to report that they were sexually assaulted by another man because it's seen in some cultures as a threat to the masculinity. It's seen as an issue. So very hard to find numbers. The absolute minimum numbers um, looking at the different studies is somewhere between two and four percent of inmates are going to be raped which is still a horrifically high number. Other studies set that as high as seven. Uh, Human Rights Watch said, and I'm not sure about this number in regards, I think what they mean is total number of inmates that have ever been in the system since they started looking at it, 4.3 million. So who's the most vulnerable here? Juveniles, young men placed in prison, isolated and alone, often for minor or drug crimes, primary target. Most of this rape is same gender rape, and these assaults are really due to the structure of the prisons. We segregate our societies, our prisons. There's also, even if you don't have rape, very high rates of coerce or pressure to have sex. And we think, again, numbers very hard to find, that if, let's just say, 5% of people are, are actually raped, that about four times that amount, or maybe 20, I've seen numbers as high as 25%, but let's say with 20, maybe 20% are coerced or pressured to have sex, not strictly speaking raped. We do have issues of race and ethnicity in prison. Now, inmates typically will self-segregate into uh, racial and ethnic groups. If you go to Central Prison in Raleigh, you will absolutely see um, this type of segregation. Blacks with blacks, whites with whites. And interesting enough, even in in and you can have subgroups emerge. So if you go to some prisons, um, and if they're predominantly, say, if there's a large population of Hispanics, you might see El Salvadorans uh, won't hang out with Guatemalans, who won't hang out with Mexicans, and they can self-segregate. So prison violence, often an outlet for the racial tension we see, and the ethnic, and race is really going to determine all sorts of things, who your friends are, what jobs you get, where your cells are located. And it also gives you an identity. Now, this raises the issue of STGs. Um, STGs are security threat groups, or what we would call gangs. And a lot of gangs are born, or created rather, f funded to some extent, but recruited out of prison. So this can be a major issue. Now, American gangs tend to be based on violence and ethnic and racial. One of the interesting things is European gangs often have religious connotations. So you'll have Muslim gangs in some of their prisons. Here are some of the top prison gangs in the United States and I included some information when they're founded. So Aryan Nation, uh, founded in 1968. This is a white prison gang. Black Guerrilla Family came out of a black street gang in the 1960s. The Bloods, another black gang in the 1960s. Uh, the Crips, again, 1960s. The Mexican Mafia, this is an earlier one, L.A. prison gang, 1950s. Um, then you got a, uh, you got the rest of these are, again, you know, vice lords, uh, gangsters, discipline. Um, you'll notice that they're heavily ethnic. Prison employment, if you want to work in prison. Now, one of the things about prison employment is it's a state job. It's very steady, very secure. Uh, now, recently, standards have risen. Uh, we're seeing the, the sort of professionalization, I would say, that occurred for the police a generation ago is becoming more common in corrections. We're really starting to say, we're going to require you to be more than just a prison guard, your corrections officer. Um, and this is, you know, true in um, other countries went there first. Um, so if you go to some European countries like Norway, uh, you don't set foot inside a prison as a corrections officer if you don't have a two or a four year degree in it. It's really considered a profession. Um, if you want to become a, a corrections officer in the United States though, typically you'll take some type of 
entry exam, a civil service exam. There can be some military style training. Uh, definitely there's going to be some classwork and physical training. Um, it's not as intensive. It's a little bit more abbreviated than um, some of the others, like the police or the uh, highway patrol, say. Um, it's got a military structure. Very often you have captains, lieutenants, sergeants, and officers. So it's paramilitary in its structure. Uh, inside the prison, if you want a job, here are some of the jobs that uh, we classically associate. Obviously, there are administrative jobs, training jobs, medical jobs, but these are what we would typically associate. A block officer, a work detail supervisor, an industrial shop and school officer, the yard officers, or the tower guards. And most of those, by the way, unarmed. You don't want to have your guards walking around with guns in prison because they can be taken away. There's usually a strong physical separation between anybody that's got a gun and any inmate. Inmate disciplinary policies, because people misbehave in prison. Um, there are three primary goals here. You want a safe and orderly living environment, not just for the prisoners. You want it also for the officers who are there. Um, you don't want riots and fights all the time because if you get them, uh, when the guards go to break them up, they could be stabbed, they could be killed. You want to instill respect for authority of the correction officer administrators. The, the best way that you can give an order is give it and have it obeyed. Um, the worst type of order you can give is you give an order and it's ignored. People obey people they respect or fear. Um, so you want to teach the values of respect uh, and you want to get them so that they will respect authority and hopefully this can even in part carry over into the um, the real world. Well sometimes they don't behave so let's talk about sanctioning them. Inmates will see that there are rules and rules require punishment here in prison and corrections officers have the most difficult part of their job of punishing prisoners. Now this can range from things like simple loss of privileges like you're not going to go to the commissary or you've got uh, all the way to serious things like you're going to be in solitary confinement. And of course then there's the even kind of more structural punishment of you mis misbehave long enough in prison you won't get out until you've served your whole sentence. There's no good time for example in a prison or jail then. So we are limited somewhat in using force here. Um, you can't use it just because you feel like it. You can use force as a corrections officer if you're acting in self-defense, if you're trying to protect a third party, if you're upholding the established rules of the institution, if you're preventing a crime or preventing escape. But there is a standard the court looks at is you cannot be malicious, which is kind of evil, or sadistic, which is someone that enjoys inflicting pain. Um, it's not a question about how much force was used, but did you use it in good faith very often. Okay, let's talk a little bit quickly about female corrections officers. For many years, we didn't have them in women's men's prison and vice versa. Uh, although less so, there were almost always men in, in women's prison in some ways. The belief was women were not physically strong enough. And if you had women in men's prisons, it would cause a breakdown of authority and disciplinary problems. This pretty much went by the by, in part because of some Supreme Court cases, in part because of the practicality and the changing nature of society. Today there's about 100,000 women who work in correctional facilities, both in, in our segregated male and segregated female facilities. And female corrections officers have proved, by and large, just as successful, just as effective as their male counterparts, pretty much the same way they proved themselves in policing. Um, the primary problem we see for women in male prisons is sexual misconduct. And again, though, you flip that, men working in women's prisons, yeah, uh, we, we see issues there as well. Protecting prisoners' rights. Do they have any rights? Well, the 13th Amendment of the Constitution of the United States um, says that inmates do not have the same rights as regular Americans. What it says is slavery, which is almost a complete absence of rights, is not outlawed for, it's described in the 13th Amendment, involuntary servitude is not outlawed for a crime. 
traditionally courts followed what they called the hands-off doctrine. Uh, sometimes you heard it expressed as judicial death. When you died, we weren't interested in you until, I mean, when you went to prison, you were dead civilly. So civil death. You got your rights back when you walked out the door. Till then, you belonged to the prison. Um, by the 1970s, this was breaking down. And the standard today is more of a balancing act. Prisoners are going to have some very minimal, and I want to stress this, minimal rights. And the dominant thing we're going to be concerned about is what does the institution need? How can the institution function? Um, in the system as it is. So one of the standards in some court cases, if you want to look these up, and we teach a correctional law class or did, you can look at Estelle v. Gamble, which came down in 76, and Wilson v. Cedar, which came down in 91. Um, if the prisoners show that the, they were aware of a harmful condition and took no steps to take or, or fix it, that can be a problem for the prison. Prisoners can be successful in a lawsuit there. You also have, under Wilson versus Cedar, I, uh, Cedar, basic human needs have to be met, such as basic food, not lobster thermidor, but basic food, warmth, and exercise. Um, simple requirements. All right, some issues with female prisoners, uh, which are treated often different than men, they often lack self-efficacy. It's hard for them in many ways to represent themselves. Their criminal behavior is often linked to parental stress. Um, they're often, very often, mothers. They're far more likely than their male counterparts to have significant mental health problems. They're also more likely to be victims. Victims of physical abuse, victims of sexual abuse. They also typically are involved in unhealthy or poorly structured intimate relations, uh, and their lives are marked by high levels of poverty and homelessness, which is somewhat similar to their male counterparts there. One of the interesting things, and here's another chart, and I know I give you a lot of charts, but um, this is the breakdown of age, uh, uh, excuse me, age and ethnicity in female prisons. Now, you notice this is really different than male prisons. First of all, let's look at race and ethnicity. Whites are about 65% of the American population. They're usually typically under 40% of the prison population. But here, it's much closer. African Americans are 12%. Here, they're 21%. Hispanics are 15 to 18%. Here, they're actually a little underrepresented as women. So the interesting thing there is women seem to have less innate race or ethnical discrimination, if, if that's what's going on, in prisons than males. Also, you can look at age, and this is pretty interesting. You'll notice that they're slightly older than the male populations. Um, and you, you'll notice a lot of them are in their 30s and going into their 40s. So the age breakdown is really interesting as well. Special problems here. Here's the big one, motherhood. Um, 7 out of 10 or 70% of female inmates who are incarcerated are mothers. Or they're caring for a minor, chi minor child. And, and this is a real problem. Um, the cost of staying in touch can be high. And just the cost really to society. If you have a a single mother who has two or three or four children and she goes to prison and there's no, as I said, a single mother, there's no father to step in or grandparents, even if there are grandparents, it's going to be expensive. Who's going to pay for the kids? Who's going to take care of the kids financially? You could put a woman in prison, it might cost you $35,000 a year to put her in prison, but if she has four children that you have to put in foster care and pay the people taking care of them, all of a sudden, you could wind up paying $100,000 a year to put this person in prison. And that's just the financial cost. There's emotional cost. There's social cost. Now, as for the culture inside women's prison, it is much different. If you walk into a male prison, there is a degree of tension. But there's lower levels of gang violence. Um, but there is sexual victimization here. Often, it's said, at least, that women will recreate families 
with inmates playing specific roles. So you'll have a dominant older female and a younger female, and sometimes they are referred to as the man and the woman, the husband and the wife. Younger inmates often will rely upon mothers or more senior inmates for emotional support and companionship, including up to um, dealing with administration um, and even sometimes sex. Inmates, female inmates also get pregnant. So you'll notice here that if we're looking at admission, about 3% of women going into federal prison are pregnant, 4% going into state prison, 5% going into jail. So if you've got a pregnant woman in jail, you know, what are you going to do when she goes into labor? How are you going to recognize her when she's in labor? You're going to isolate her? You're going to give her a special diet? You're going to give her special monitoring? You can see how this could be expensive. Let's talk about returning to society. Each year about 650,000 people get out of American prisons. A lot of these people fail and wind up back in prison. Now you can get out because you got paroled, you maxed out, you were pardoned, that's freakishly rare, or there's temporary releases called furlough, but most of the time you're going to complete a sentence. So what are the problems to re-entry? Well the big problem is um, how are you going to transition from prison to the community? Um, and there's, there's got to be some sort of treatment curriculum or follow through that goes in and keeps helping you. And they're going to face a lot of barriers. So a lack of transportation, we're a car centered society, difficult to get housing, limits on employment, and this can be complicated by their older now and mental illness issues. So here are your rates of recidivism. And employment and education does seem to help us. So if we look at these numbers, the, the blue number is your recidivist incarceration, your um, uh, brownish number, orangish number is your arrest. You'll notice that if you had a correctional job, um, if you had uh, recidivist incarceration, it's helpful. And then if you look at your corrections, it's helpful. All of these can reduce rates overall, but again, no magic bullet. So reentry issues, housing, jobs, family, support, health, substance abuse, and the possibility of parole revocation or recidivism. Desistance is this whole thing, how you get people to stop, the process whereby you decrease and reintegrate the person into society, decrease criminal behavior. The most important thing obviously is self-motivation. I liken this to alcoholism. How do you stop someone from drinking? You don't. They do. They decide to stop drinking. You can help people. You can lead them to that decision. And this is help with reentry for prisoners, finding them jobs, finding them housing. But all this preparation needs to start before that, that you shove them out in the wor world and close that door. Most of the time this is centered on psychological treatment and counseling, but also sometimes on education. So what works? Um, one of the things that is common is work release. Um, about, again, 43% wind up back in prison. And if you don't plan for something, it ain't going to happen very often. And the most critical thing here is getting a job. Because a job allows you to live in society. You can, with a job, in theory, get housing. You can you know, get support. You can take care of your family. So maybe, particularly for minor things, you can think about things like expungement, not having to, or banning the box laws, which means I don't have to tell my employer I'm an ex-convict if I was arrested for a nonviolent crime. There can be special cases, and we're going to talk a little bit about sex offenders here. Uh, society holds a great deal of fear for this, um, and we're particularly terrified of them attacking our children, the child molester. So it's probably the worst thing you can call someone. If you call them a child molester or a pedophile, um, that's the hardest stone I think you can throw at someone in society. So very often for someone that's convicted of a sexual offense, particularly a sexual offense against a child, we're going to have special issues like no contact with children, mandatory mental health treatment, can't live near children, can't be employed near children. We want to remove the danger to them and remove the temptation from you. One of the things North Carolina does is 
um, we have a North Carolina sex registry, sex offender registry. Every sexual offender released into the population is registered. And you can call these up. These are readily available. I do it in class. Um, this is a public record, so I'm not disclosing someone when I put Mr. Martin's name up there. But he was convicted of a sex offense. Every one of those little shields or triangles is a sex offender in Raleigh, and this is over near US-1. But anywhere you are, you're going to see these. You must be registered. We must know where you are. We must be able to track you. The reason we do that is if there's a sexual offense, if a child is kidnapped, a, sexual, a, a child is assaulted, obviously, since uh, child molestation is a lifestyle and a pattern very often, not a single one-off event, we're going to go to these people to see if they have the child or they're responsible for it. So it's going to help us solve sex crimes. Um, many states, including North Carolina, have this sexual registry. Uh, anybody in the public is allowed to search for it. Offenders must registate, uh, register and update as they move for jobs or registry. It's very important. All right. Kept it right around at uh, 45, 50 minutes here, a little bit shorter, uh, I guess 50 minutes. Um, we got one more chapter to go, and whenever you're ready, just go ahead and log on. And have a good afternoon, evening, day, weekend, whatever you are.